So I was eager to get the Tundra back in here because uh, finally my, my prize uh, came in for this truck. The rear diff and it's a lot easier this time taking it apart because everything's already just been apart a month ago. The fluid is out of it, the brake lines are disconnected, the, the flashlight is nowhere to be seen. Brake lines are disconnected, the e-brake is disconnected. And brake lines were kind of fighting me a little bit, but I found a, a pattern where I could pull the axles back three inches without having to take out my brake lines. And now that's by splitting it right in the union. But all the fluid was pissing out of it before. So I took another piece of um, brake line that I had in my, my stash and just cut the line off, hammered it and bent it over so it sealed it in and just screwed it back in so that the main uh, feed coming from the front doesn't piss all the fluid out. This this one wheel is pissing out some. I don't know worry about that. Because it took a little while to get a bled. Needed two people to do it. So, uh, I'm probably gonna go call for the night, but uh, I figure we'll just let this trip. The uh, rear end ended up developing a leak out of the case, which I initially thought what the issue was with this was that it had a leak. So I quickly cleaned it and just mixed up some, uh, you know, the dum dum or the whatever you want to call it, the two part epoxy that's on a, a stick that you knead together. Cleaned it real quick and then just jammed that on there. And uh, that stopped the leak because it still had a full, a full pan. And I removed it, but that was the initial uh, problem. So that we gotta address that too. I gotta uh, make a patch for that tomorrow when we get it all uh, disassembled and I get it all cleaned out, get all the oil out of the back side of it, and we'll, we're gonna uh, beef up the back side of this, and then uh, you know paint it up and grease it up and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it should be good. So. I'm calling it for a night, but you guys are going to be right back in a second, so I'll see you when I see you. So it's the next day, not that that matters to you guys, but um, I went and uh, popped the original one back out of the rear end, and of course it went much easier because it uh, was just taken apart a month ago, so everything uh, was already clean and removed on the hardware, and I got them on the bench next to each other just to do a comparison, make sure you don't have any issues of, of any sort. And uh, for those who don't know, I, I bought this Tundra used with a, um, a failing uh, rear end and um, a little bit of frame uh, rust issues that still need to be addressed. So I, got the I bought the truck right and this is um, the uh, process of trying to get that rear back into shape to be functional. Uh, little did I know that the uh, carrier, he's called a carrier uh, or differential, is was very hard to come by, and I ended up uh, scoring one for uh, 50 bucks on eBay, where everybody else was between 600 and a thousand dollars for them. Uh, it is one year only, and uh, the gear ratio is different due to the fact that it is a double cab. I guess the double cab is a little heavier, a little bigger. Most of the uh, Tundras run 391 gears with the V8, and uh, this one is running 410 is a four wheel drive truck, so you have to stick with whatever is in the front. So the front axle has four tens in it, unless you want to change the front to a different thing, etc., etc. Long story short, I got one uh, with a real good deal, and uh, we're in the process of installing it. So uh, what I did temporarily was I just took the ring gear off of the original uh, differential and left the dry shaft off so the axles axle goes in there axle goes in there from your tires they could still spin uh go down the road they were suspended you know supported by their bearings it just kind of uh acted like a freewheel and i put the truck in four-wheel drive and i drove it around on the front uh differential for about 500 miles and it was absolutely fine no issues so anyway uh here are the two of them that are side by side and I do not see any difference. This is a limited slip differential, and what that means is there's um, there, there's spider gears on the inside. You can see the spider gears through the little holes. There's spider gears on the inside, but there's also clutches on the inside, and what that allows you to do is um, 
kind of like when you're going straight, if you're in ice on one tire, say this tire starts to spin, on open differential, there is no longer any traction going to this wheel. If that wheel's allowed to spin, all the energy exits out of the differential on that side, and there's literally nothing happening over here. That's why you're stuck. Or if you lift a tire off the ground and you're going over something, it just spins in the air and you're stuck. Well, with a limited slip, there's a set of clutches in there that will hold for a while until a certain uh, level, and then they will disconnect and allow that. But it allows pressure to go on that one wheel that uh, is still on the ground to get you out of trouble. And they are a limited slip. It's different from a locked or a, a locker or some other type of rear where those are just physically locked right across. You can lock and unlock some of them with either a cable or electric solenoid or a lever, I should say. Um, and this is not the case. Anyway, I thought this was just gonna be an open differential, but I'm looking at the two of them. Now bear in mind that the, the ring gear usually came to here, so it looks a little different, but they look like they're exactly the same setup. I do not see any difference uh, between the two of them that this is not a limited slip. I was going to take um, this setup, put that ring gear on this setup and move that whole assembly over to here. The problem with doing that is you have to match the ring gear to the pinion gear. The pinion gear is that gear that's in the front. And so here it is. So this is your, your pinion gear and your ring gear. So you have this direction as far as adjustment and how far in as an adjustment. And then it rubs an, a certain pattern um, on the face of the gear for longevity, um, noise, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a art in itself, setting that stuff up, shimming them correctly, getting them to mesh just right. You take a, an ink, you rub an ink on the side of them, you run it through the gear, you run it back, you see where the wear pattern is, you shift it around. Well, um, I don't have the shims to try to uh, fine tune that. I was hoping that if I was gonna take them apart, if the shims measured the same in this one, they measured the same in that one, I could have just swapped them even, but uh, I think we're just gonna go ahead and install that all as one unit by itself. You know, it's a bunch of gabbing going on at one time, but I figured I'd explain it a little bit. But before we can install this, we have to get underneath and um, repair the leak in the uh, housing that caused all this in the first place. So I'm gonna go down there and that will start cleaning that up. So come back under the truck and um, so what had caused this whole problem to begin with is the, uh, uh, we're in the new northeast, very rusty uh, issues. Toyotas have a problem with rust and the uh, rear differential is no different. So it has like, um, you, know, you can see up top still, there's still some flaky, like crunchiness coming off on that. See that right there? So that's not how the whole rear of the pump kit was, something like that. You can see where I tapped it all off. We're back down to metal again. And when I initially filled it up, it wasn't leaking when I put the it back temporarily. Then after about a day or so, it did start dripping in one spot, and you could see this, uh, you know, um, putty of sorts that's kind of put over it. There it goes, just fell right off. Again, I put that on when it was in the process of leaking oil, but it, it did stop it for. It needed to do what it needed to do. Let's see if we can get up inside here. So I'm trying to find out where that leak was. And uh, I think right where that little tit is right there, it is right there. So that is where the hole is in the rear um, casing that's on there. The rest of it doesn't look too bad, but I think we're gonna have to go in the uh, outside. We're gonna clean it up with a grinder. We'll see if it kind of blows through anywhere else. But I'm probably gonna make a steel patch, probably about that big. We'll probably go right up the other side of it too, over and down, because if it's spotted out here, it's probably just a stain on this side. So I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna go do now. I'm gonna go take a wire wheel to the uh, uh, back casing here. We'll go clean that up and see if there's any other uh, iffy spots, and then we're gonna have to uh, uh, repair accordingly. So uh, let me get the wire wheel on this.
Yeah, it just looks like right there and right below it by about half inch looks kind of iffy. So I think we're going to go with a patch probably about that big and across the whole bottom. Got to clean that real good too with some uh, contact cleaner. You want to make sure there's no oil in any of that. It'll make a, for your welds to start popping a little bit, you know. So uh, let me go uh, get to making a patch up for that and uh, we'll stitch it back together. Let's go cut that out of there. I believe that's a 16 gauge. I don't want to go much thicker than that because it makes it uh, harder to uh, mold into position and that should be more than enough to uh, uh, stop our leak. There's no structural uh, capacity to that. It's just a seal for the end of the axle. So uh, let me get that uh, cleaned up and uh, get some rust off of it and uh, we'll start forming. So I think I'm going to do is kind of a uh, a double attack on this thing. What I ended up doing was I, I took a hammer and I kind of tapped it in. I'm not sure if it's showing up on camera. So this is recessed a little bit. I'm going to take the welder and I'm going to fill this in and grind it flat. And then I'm going to take the plate that I made and uh, we're going to go over it with that. We'll weld that into place also. So it kind of gives us uh, a double shot at it. Um, getting a little bit of porosity around it. You can have the, the capacity of leaking. I'm probably going to put some uh, uh, sealer on the welds after I do this also but again we just want to kind of do this once and it'll be harder to fix when uh, it's full of gear oil let's put it that way so I'd rather give it its best shot now so I'm gonna go get the welder fired up I got to get in there and get a little bit more clean a little cleaner metal I still have to hit it with a contact cleaner uh, the inside is wiped out pretty good and dried I'll probably take a, uh, a torch with map gas and uh, heat it up first on the inside and kind of wipe up any ash that's left, try to dry up any oil that's in it so it doesn't uh, contaminate the welds. See all that sparkling that's coming off of there? That's the, the impurities uh, burning out of it. wheel one more time so like I said I uh, I filled that up with weld kind of you know stitched it in and then ground it flat and then uh, put the uh, piece of steel that we just got done making up in there and then I have a big hose clamp going around the rear pumpkin just to, to draw it tight as possible and then I just took a ball beam hammer and kind of tapped the edge so that the edge uh, is nice and close to the 
what's left of the pumpkin here. So I'm going to come back. I'm not going to show any of the welding because I don't want to kill the camera. But I'm going to go and I'm going to put a bunch of spot welds around the flange part of it first. And then I'm going to come back. If, it, if it's risen at all, I'll tap it back down. Um, and then I'm going to come back with tacks probably every uh, three quarters of an inch or so. And we'll tack this guy. Probably work from the center out. And then I'll buzz the whole thing around and take the band off. Yeah. Take the band off, buzz it all the way around, and then clean it up with the flapper disc, and we'll see how it looks from there. So let me get that welding done, and I'll turn you right back on. So that's all welded up. Looks pretty good. But again, you never know if you, you miss a, like a little pinhole or something that can allow it to uh, to seep over time. Um, but you know, we already have the. The original hole welded up and then I kind of figured that it may be quite thin somewhere through here so that's why I went and um, beefed it up. And now I'm going to go and take and go over the welds with um, this stuff called the right stuff. And uh, this, it's a gasket maker of, of types. Uh, I, I've grown quite fond of using this. I've used it on quite a few things. I've probably been using it about three years and I would say it's my number one go-to. And it pretty much is just set up like a cheese whiz can. You pull down on the trigger and it starts going out the top. So I'm going to go take that and spread that all over the weld uh, seam and let that cure up while we are reassembling the rest of it. So I'm going to get that knocked out and then we'll get on to uh, probably working on the front. Let's finish it up cleaning up that flange. <laughs> That's steel, so it uh, holds up pretty good to a wire wheel. If it's aluminum, you gotta be much more careful. So I got that rear differential all back together. Um, the only thing I need to do is put fluid in it. I wanna let it set up for a while. And the reason why I'm saying that is uh, internally, where the weld uh, hole was, where I welded it up, I also took the um, uh, sealer and spread it on the inside of the hole kind of like packed it from that side also just to again just uh, ensure against any other issues and the gasket i had for the setup was the wrong one so i ended up putting the right stuff on this side and that side spread it out evenly uh let it set up for about five minutes i bolted it together and i let it sit for about a half an hour not tight. It, it was it was drawn in, but it wasn't tight. And then after I got done putting a dry shaft and some other things, grease in the dry shaft, I came back and sucked it down and then it pushed out the little bit of material that you see there. So we should be fine. That's how I sealed it before temporarily and it didn't leak at all. And uh, that's what we're going to go with now. So where I am at this point is everything, as I said, is together. It's easy to do because now everything's been apart and I'm back together so many times. Uh, we're gonna let that cure and we'll fill it up. But while the truck is in here and the weather's real bad out back, uh, outside, I want to take some time and continue with some of the issues with the truck. And um, kind of going on with the rust, uh, inhibiting rust from getting any further. Someone wrote and said, well, what does the Tundra look like that didn't have any of that oil sprayed underneath it? And I kind of like to use this for an example, but this went into Toyota. Toyota had a uh, frame inspection kind of deal. And what they do is they check it. There's no holes. They spray this concoction on it and, uh, you know, call it a day. And that's, that's what you're good for. Well, that stuff is very, um, like, it, it's not a liquid. It, it kind of hardens up over time well here's the problem with doing that what it does is just makes a shield between the inner and the outer locations and causes it to just chip and hold moisture in behind it i'm going to try to find you a good spot i could scrape away and explain better than let's go with right here probably so you see how that stuff is 
it, it's it's almost like it's lifted from it. And you see all the rust that's behind it. Well, that's it, it's useless. It's actually making making it worse than if you did nothing at all. So for those who are asking, like you know, why don't I use a real undercoating? Um, that's the reason why is because it doesn't do what it's supposed to. You know, it, it's a bunch of hype, but it doesn't really do what it needs to do. Possibly, if you had a new car and you um had it on fresh metal and you got the undercoating on there it would help but as you can see here you see exactly what it's doing it's just look at that it's just you know it's just sheets and sheets of the stuff that now just become a big moisture barrier like that looked like it was all okay right but look what it did it's just you know it just holds the moisture in there so now if you can get this off of there which is going to be a pain in the ass that's what we're going to deal with for the next i don't know how long but uh, we're going to go be picking this stuff away, getting as much of this off as we can, and then I'm going to go back and undercoat it uh, with oil like I did on the other, other truck. And uh, whatever we find for rust damage, we're going to repair that also. So I just kind of wanted to show you what we're dealing with as far as that's concerned and why I use the oil like I do because this is what the uh, other option that uh, everybody seems to be uh, asking me, why don't I do this? Well, in our area, it just does not work. It just makes makes it look pretty maybe for a little bit because it, it made it the underneath, you look quick underneath the truck, you see that it's black, but it's it's useless. Again, it, it, it does more damage than good. So that's it. I'm gonna go take a bunch of time, go get some, uh, maybe some lunch and uh, take my time to pick all this stuff away. And I'll turn you back on when uh, that part of it's done. We'll see what it looks like. Just touched this corner and it fell apart. Just want to kind of show you. Like, so you can see that you know, literally, it's doing nothing but holding moisture behind it. So. How'd you like to have to do this job, huh? Looks like we got some work to do there, huh? Doesn't help that all that dirt just stays up inside there and just holds that moisture too, you know? All this debris that's in there is more dirt than rust, and then that dirt again holds the moisture there and it just never dries out. So Well, we're here though. We'll get it fixed. So I think I grabbed the camera again. I found a good example of what I was trying to talk about. This over here was kind of the stuff was already uh, uh, down here rather was already removed, and um, I went and I knocked some of this off. And if you look behind it, you can actually see the color difference between where it's dry and where water is still on the metal there, and it was just sealed in behind this stuff, you know? So, that's the biggest issue right there, is it just gets in behind it, it just stays there and just stays wet all the time and just creates more rust. That's a good spot right there. Right. Wet, dry. In the aftermath.
see the salt. That's salt right there. Knocked everything off the bottom of the suspension. Uh, compressed air was my best option. I shot the air gun, I would just get behind it and it would just flake it away. Got some starting right there too. This side's nowhere near as bad though. And you want to know why they call me Musty One? I call him Musty One. <laughs> ah. Holy. Whew. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to go clean up the floor and uh, get all this crap out of the way as you can see there's quite a bit and uh big so a creeper can roll around i'm gonna start on the rust i'm not sure if i'm gonna make it on this video or not it might be a, a little on the long side but uh uh i want to get uh get the welding done i'm gonna let the body kind of dry out overnight in here all the area that you saw where i flaked off and the moisture was coming uh was behind it i want to make sure this is as dry as i can have it before i spray it with the oil so it gives it the best uh, capacity of shielding from moisture. Why, why trap the moisture in, you know? So that's where we are. So, uh, I don't know, probably a good 10 pounds of crap there on the floor right here. And I'm sure more is going to come when I start cutting into the frame. <laughs> 